in uh, part two of a little message on giving, this little series on giving, are what are the foundational beliefs of generous givings. And I want to welcome anybody who's new here today and those, of course, who are watching this by uh, online. And so we want to begin with uh, our current environmental crisis. If you've been paying attention to the news from time to time, there are specials on PBS about the pollution that is coming into our oceans and, and, and these bans on plastic bags and straws and such that have uh, uh, some floating areas in the ocean, they tell me, are the size of Texas, just full of plastic debris that we throw away. And most recently, uh, the city of Seattle not only banned plastic bags like we have here in our county, but also one-use plastic straws and plastic uh, utensils knives and forks and etc. They're not using those things anymore because we are polluting our earth with things that do not decompose, uh, sometimes even forever. And all of that is because we are in a consumer culture, right? I'm looking at what the marketing nerds say, you are consumers. I'm a consumer, you're a consumer. We buy things, we consume things, and we buy them again. Oh, we throw them out, and then we buy them again. And that's the way our economy operates. In fact, uh, it is economy of planned obsolescence. Did you know now that your washing machine is designed to last you about seven years? Instead of 20 or 25 like my mom's washers did, no, our appliances are designed to fail about seven to 10 years so that you can do what? Buy another one. And your cars are the same way. And everything we buy is now planned to wear out so that we can buy it again. This is the way our culture and our economy is built on. Um, whatever goes up in smoke or down the drain is good business. This is your America. As Christians, though we are in a consumer culture, we need to go another direction, and we need to uh, stave off the influences of consumerism and become stewards, stewards. And last Sunday, I talked to you about the first major belief of a generous giver, and that is generous givers believe that God creates everything, and he is the owner, and he is the controller. We saw the potter and the clay illustration, which we won't forget. Today, we see that generous givers who believe that God is the creator and the owner and the controller believe and began to view themselves as stewards or managers of God's resources. And to steward, by definition, is simply to manage or look after another's property. Uh, we used to call them stewardesses, right, in airplanes, right, because they were always female. But they are flight attendants. They are stewards, nonetheless, anyone who serves the public food on a train or a plane or a ship are stewards in that they oversee the care of the public. Um, in a household, who, someone who waits on the people there are, is the butler or the steward. Um, sometimes you have event planners, we call them, wedding planners. These are stewards making sure the bride gets what she wants and uses the resources provided in the appropriate way. And many shops in blue-collar industries have shop stewards. They are watching over the workers and their environment to make sure they are. So we understand the word steward as someone who is responsible for another's property. It is also a theological a word and, and belief. It is the belief that humans are responsible for the world and we should take care of it. Believers in stewardship are usually people who believe in one God, as we do, who created the universe and all that is in it, you know, owner, uh, owner, owner and controller. And we believe that we, therefore, must take care of creation and look after it. And this includes the animals and the environment. Just go to Genesis 1 and see that God put Adam and Eve in charge of the earth. Here it is. Take care of it. Name the animals. Take care of what I have given you. And so stewardship is a discipleship issue. It is being transformed from being a consumer, a selfish, self-centered person into a steward 
and a servant here on this earth. Um, I've been working on that. It's, you know, it's why I, one of the reasons I go to the gym, because I'm a steward of my body. I want to take care of this gift that God has given me. Um, I am the recycler in our family. Uh, two, three other families give me their cans and their bottles, and about once a month when I have a truckload, I take a couple of the grandkids and we go to the recycler and we cash all those things in. And the last time we went, we walked away with $58. Man, 58 bucks. And we went and went to McDonald's and we went bowling and <laughs> that kind of thing. You know, so I'm a person that recycles. I repurpose. I reuse things. Um, at the rummage sale, I picked up two lawnmowers on the side of the street. I brought them home. I repaired them and we sold them for 15 bucks each. Now, that wasn't worth my time. But it was still the value that I have is that this is not to go in the trash. This is fixable. If it's fixable, let's fix it and put it back into use. If you know me, th this is me, okay? And if your car isn't fixed, I'm not happy with you. <laughs> if something is broken, I want it fixed. And I want it fixed when? Yesterday. Now you know a little bit about me, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I'm into fixing things that are broken and not just throw them out. Try to fix them. Sorry, I went off on that. That's not in my notes. So, so a Christian steward wisely develops and uses and shares what God has entrusted to their care, knowing that God will hold them accountable. Matthew 25 he talks about accountability of what we have been given. So what does the Bible teach about Christian stewardship? And basically, this content is in my membership class. So if you'll remember, there's a whole lesson on Christian stewardship, and these are the points that I cover in the membership class. And I thought, what better way than to put them into this message today? So here are the, the resources that we are to develop and use and share. Number one, and there are five of them, life. Psalms 139 says that we, each of us, are fearfully and wonderfully made. God created us, gave us life. Acts 17, we live and move and have our being. Life is a gift itself. Every breath you breathe, your next heartbeat is a gift from God. And stewards recognize that life itself is a gift from God. So what? Romans 12, 1, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's gift, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. This is the place to begin with stewardship, is to recognize that God has given you life. He has given his life for your life, so why wouldn't you then give your life back to him to offer yourselves fully to God in our life? This is a call to surrender not just your physical body, to the Lord, but your whole being, body, mind, and soul. So how could you live this out? Well, you need to come to your senses about wasteful living. This was the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. You know, there was a younger man, and two brothers, the younger of them came to his father, I want my inheritance now before you're dead, Dad. And that's not okay today, and it wasn't okay then. But he did it. And he went off and it says he squandered his wealth in wild living and he spent everything and he began to be in need. You know the story. He's there in the pig pen and he wants to eat the pig food. And it says that he came to his census. He came to his census. And he looks on the past and says, you know what? I've been living like a pig. I've been selfish and, and I've spent everything, but I will go back to my father. He, this point of coming to your senses, is you, you, you realize that you've been living a self-centered and selfish life, a consumer existence, and you say, you know what, that's got to stop. That God didn't put me on this earth just to consume resources, but rather to share my life with others. And when we come to our senses, we wake up from that selfish and self-centered living and we decide to return to God. And we understand four things. We understand, first of all, that God loves us. And that son believed that when he returned that his father loved him. Didn't go after him, but was there waiting to embrace him when he returned. God is a loving God. But sin has separated us, number two. 
and that Christ died for our sins that we might be forgiven and being reconciled to God. But this is a choice. We must choose. We must come to our senses to choose to repent and believe what Christ has done for us. This is the point of surrender where we give our lives to Jesus Christ. When I was converted, that's what I said to Jesus. Take my life. Here it is. Take my life. It is that surrender, that stewardship begins. And I encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to start there by surrendering your life back to God. It's what kind of what we do in child dedication, right? We're giving the child back to God. Give yourself back to God. The second thing that God has given us to be stewards over is our time. Ecclesiastes 3, 1, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. There's a saying in our house that goes this way, this bright new day complete with 24 hours of opportunities, choices, and attitudes, a perfectly matched set of 1,440 minutes. This unique gift, this one day cannot be exchanged, replaced, or refunded. Handle with care. Make the most of it. There's only one to a customer. Perhaps you've heard that. So time is a great gift from God. And God numbers our days, Psalms 139, and we are stewards and thus need to be acutely aware of the fact that God has given us time and we shouldn't waste our time. Ephesians 5.15 says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of your time or every opportunity. Some versions say time there. Because the days are evil and, and also the days are short, right? Life is short. Life is short. Three score and ten, eighty years, and if by strength, longer. But we don't have all the time in the world. Life is short. So how do you live this out? Well, I just say do a, do a time budget like we do a money budget. We talk about this is the, the, our paycheck and this is where our money is going to go. We assign it because if we don't, somebody else is going to take it from us. And the same way as the time. If you don't plan out your day, then somebody will certainly uh, fill it with something. Your priority is going first. Practice that and your life will be different. So conduct a time budget. Then let me meddle here a little bit because sometimes in church you hear the idea that time is money. We've heard that, right? Everybody's heard that. Time is money. So instead of giving money to the church, I'll just give my time to the church. And those are two separate resources. And if that's your thought that, well, I can just volunteer more and give less because I don't have the money or whatever, that somehow God's going to be okay with that. And I just want you to tell me what verse in the Bible you use for that because I haven't, I haven't found that, that you can substitute time and money. Uh, the church needs both your time and your money. Uh, and God needs both your time and, and your money. So I just wanted you to think about that. If you believe that, that I can substitute my time and stay in place of money or some other resource. Think on that. Number three, uh, talent. <coughs> First Peter 4.10, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. As faithful stewards, there's that word, of God's grace in its various forms. So we are gifted people. Just look at any two-year-old and you can see that they are gifted, all right? And uh, if you have the gift of music, if you can sing, you got that at birth. I mean, you were born with pipes. You can sing and you can be on tune and, and so forth. Uh, you're given that as, as something that is an attribute you got at birth. And over your life, you discover that and you develop that and you become a star on The Voice, perhaps. Um, but also, when you become a believer, the Bible is very clear that you also receive a spiritual gift from God. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, to each one has been given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So our gifts, our talents, our abilities that God has given us at birth and at conversion are there not to, uh, for our own benefit per se or to make a lot of money with, Although some people are very gifted and they make a lot of money because of that. Uh, but they're there primarily to be of service to others. And so 
we have been given these talents. And so how do you live this out? It's simply start sharing the talents and the abilities and the gifts that God has given you. Again, they're not just for you, therefore the benefit of others. And our dear friend Willie Bruce, who passed away in 2010, was a great guy in our church. He was very talented when it came to woodworking, made toys and all kinds of things, and metalwork, and he had this huge shop. And he was in heaven when other people were there in his shop, and he could show them how to use these tools, and he could help them construct stuff. And, he's, and he always told me, he says, I'm always working on the 10 people I need to pass my talents on to. You know, and that list never gets done. And I, I kind of learned that from him, is pass what you know on to others. And, and that's part of the reason that I have volunteered this past year, and I plan, I think, to do it again next year, is to go over to the band at fifth grade on the elementary school and teach these boys, mostly boys, how to play the trumpet, and which I did and can. And fifth grade is about my level <laughs> anyway, so... But I can teach them how to play that instrument. And that's something I know I can pass on and encourage them in their fifth grade journey into music. Um, and so live this out by pass sharing what you know on to others. And then treasure. Uh, Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Uh, tithe, 10% was the Old Testament standard, um, and the temple treasury was the only place to give it. In the New Testament, Jesus did not abolish tithing. He actually commended, he didn't really talk about it. What Jesus did in the moment where he saw a widow in the court of women, and there were 13 receptacles. Can you imagine, not just one offering plate, but 13 you know, one for the building fund, one for this fund, one for that fund. They had 13 receptacles to take people's money in the Jewish temple there. And here's a little widow, and she puts in two coins worth a half of a cent. And Jesus points it out and says, Disciples, that little lady right there put in more than all the rest of the people putting in because they put in out of their surplus. She's putting out of her need. This is what she was going to pay her rent with. And so Jesus tells us, that God is more concerned with your attitude than the amount that you give. That you're, it is a spiritual issue, how you think about giving and how you feel about giving. Paul reiterates that in 2 Corinthians 9. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, attitude, not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves a, what? Cheerful giver hilarious, free kind of person. And so this is where you need to start when you come to give, is what percentage of your income can you give cheerfully? That's where to start. Work your way up to 10% and more as God prospers you and as God increases your income. Again, attitude is more important than amount. 10% is the standard to reach and to exceed. Offering, in my understanding, we talk about tithes and offering. They are not synonymous. Tithe means 10%. Offering is that which is above and beyond the 10% for special needs. Often we will ask you to give an above and beyond gift. So we don't want you to take from your tithe and give to that. No, we want you to add to it for a special purpose and that is what we call an offering. So how do you live this out? Interesting statistics that I found uh, from a LifeWay survey, and they are a reliable company, uh, LifeWay uh, uh, Research. What churchgoers and pastors really believe about tithes? May 10th, 2018, can't get any closer than that. 1,000 churchgoers, 1,000 pastors said that 17% give more than 10%. 37 give 10%. 20% give less than 10%. 17% try to give when they can. 8% say it's really hard for me to give. And 2% honestly say I don't give. When I come to church, I don't give. So that's the range of surveys on those 2,000 people. Um, but the other thing that's happening in our church and in this world is 
there's some question about whether your tithe should go all the way to the church and or to other places. And so this same survey said that 98% said that my tithe, my 10% should go to my local church. But 48% said, no, it can also go to a Christian ministry, like Billy Graham, Young Life, World Vision, and so forth. There's tons of Christian ministry out there that are sending you literature and me literature asking for money, right? Um, 34% say, I can use some of my tithes to help an individual in need. Say, I want to give 20 bucks to that guy on the home, that homeless guy on the corner. Oh, I can count that as my tithe. Or maybe I sponsor a child and say, well, I can divert some of my tithe to that and not to my church. And then some, 18%, even say, I can divide my tithe and give some of it to a secular charity. So like United Way and Red Cross, I can include that as my tithe. The truth is, folks, I can quote Malachi 3.10 that says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse until I am blue in the face, and I know you will do what you will with your money. Because there are people out there who can ask for money better than I can. <laughs> and you fall for it. <laughs> and that's the way they are. These other organizations are very slick in how they ask for money. And they'll pull on every heartstring that you've got until they get into your wallet. And I'm not saying they're bad, I'm just saying Malachi 3.10 says, bring the tithe to the local storehouse. And that's where my tithe goes. It comes here. I give very little outside of this church. Most of it is here. All of it. My tithe comes here. So I just challenge you thinking about that in this day and age where the typical Christian gives up to six other places besides his church, his, her church. Number, uh, the last one, testimony, Matthew 10. He says to his disciples, Jesus says, go proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. I love this phrase, freely you have received, freely give. And so the disciples had a message. They had a message. They had a power. And, 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 and Jesus says, don't keep that to yourself. It didn't cost you anything. Now go and share that with the people that you meet in these various villages and towns as he sent them out two by two. Paul says this in chapter 6 of Ephesians, Pray for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel and pray that I may declare it fearlessly or boldly as I should. So Paul was very concerned that he had this treasure this body of doctrine, this body of teaching, this gospel message, this good news, and that it should be delivered and it should be declared boldly and fearlessly. And the, the place where you can mostly do that is the, with those people that already know you're Christian. And that is your oikos, those 8 to 15 people who already know you're a person of faith. Those are the people most likely going to listen to what you have to say about your faith. But if you're going to live this out, you have to be clear about what the message is. And I know that's what happens in churches. I don't know what to say. Well, you know, it's not going to happen by osmosis. You know, you can put your Bible under your pillow all you want, but it ain't going to get there. Um, you have to learn some things, and you just basically need to memorize the bridge illustration. Uh, you've heard it. I've said it here. In fact, in one of my leadership courses, I actually said, you cannot graduate from this class until you get up in front of this class and tell us the bridge illustration. And it needs to be point by point uh, as it's supposed to be. So, and if you don't know it, don't feel bad. Come to me. I'll teach you. I've got videos on it. It is the best way I have found to lead another person to Christ is simply by drawing stick figures. You can do that, right? And this bridge. And so number one is, you know, God loves you, right? God is there. You are here. That's the point, first point. Second point is sin separates us. Isaiah 59, 2 is your sins have separated you from your God. And the payment of sin is death. And that is our predicament. We are separated from God. And we try to bridge that gap. None of us ever exceeds. Like none of us ever succeeds to swim to Hawaii. You know, we'll all jump in. And you'll make it further than I do, but none of us will make it. So all of our attempts to get to God fall short. And so God says, okay, let me provide a person to help you. 
And Christ came, God incarnate came, died on the cross, paid the death penalty for our sins, made the bridge so we can be connected, reconciled to God, but it is our choice to cross that bridge. Nobody crosses automatically. It must be a choice that you make. And so those are the four spiritual laws, and it's very easily done if you simply draw those four pictures and explain it to somebody. And then at the end of that, you ask them, are you ready to cross? And how do I do that? Well, you do it in a prayer. You ask God, you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. That's number one. And the most one that we don't want to forget is then you ask God, you, ask, you, you do commit your life to following him. You ask him to lead your life. You ask him to get in the driver's seat and take control of your life. That's the lordship issue. And we must move there as well and begin to live a life under the reign and rule of God. Now, someone who is really good at that is uh, Miss Chris at our school next door uh, because she talked to me recently about how she needs to obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And we both agreed that there will be opportunities that, and they're never convenient. <laughs> how is it that I'm always busy when someone is available and open to hearing about the gospel. So two weeks ago, she tells me there's a Wonderland mom who comes. She drops off her child and just hangs out there in the playground for a little while and starts unloading to Chris all of her woes and her misery. And Chris is just like, have you ever thought about God? <laughs> and the person becomes interested. And she's watching the kids. She's on the clock, and here's a woman open to talking about God. So what does Miss Chris do? She calls another teacher, says, here, watch the kids while I take this woman into the room and lead her to Christ. And she always does it with that little picture of Jesus knocking at the door, you know. Here's the picture. Jesus knocks on the door, has a doorknob only on the inside. You open, cry, open the door and let Christ come in. And, and she was beautifully saved right there in the middle of her work day. And Miss Chris does it all the time. And this is but she has something to say. She knows these four spiritual laws and she can talk about them and that's what we need to do. And it's never convenient. I, I'm, I'm telling you, it's never going to be convenient when the opportunity presents itself. And so rejoice in that and yet somehow we need to get over the barriers that we have and the fears that we have because there are people who are ready and ripe and they're probably right in front of us if we'll just pay attention a little more. All right, gone on long enough. Let's review. Foundation belief number one, generous givers believe everything is created, everything created is owned and controlled by God. So it's God's. When we give, we're just giving back to God. And secondly, that makes us stewards, that we are managers of what God has given us. We are stewards of what? Our life, our time, our talent, our treasure, and our testimony. Amen. Thank you, Lord, that we can think about these things today and be challenged in our own stewardship of all of these things. And I know it's a difficult thing. These are, these are major things to take, to, to take care of. But I believe that you are growing each of us in various areas to challenge us in our stewardship. And Lord, if there's someone here today truly who hasn't begun this walk of stewardship by, first of all, giving their life to Jesus Christ, then this is the day. This is the day not to delay, but to surrender to Jesus Christ, to confess your sins and invite Christ to come in and to begin his transforming process and to say farewell to the life of selfishness and self-centeredness and consumerism and say yes to a life of service and joy and generosity. In Jesus' name.